What's up guys, my name's Stu, and today we are talking about some of the strengths and weaknesses of Starship Specializations. Every tier 6 ship has some amount of specialization seating. Except for the Inchala refit, but that's a unique case. Each specialization has things that it's really good at and things that it's not really good at. So the specialization seating on a starship is really going to determine uh, what kind of build it's going to be well suited to or not well suited to. Now, first off, I should point out that I am only covering starship specializations in this video, so I won't be going over the captain specializations in your skill tree. However, if you do want more information on those, leave a comment down below. The first one I'm going to go over is Miracle Worker. Miracle Worker Bridge Officer seating is particularly nice for energy weapon builds, largely due to the ability Narrow Sensor Bands. This ability provides a really nice bonus damage buff to energy weapon damage. Miracle Worker also has Mixed Armament Synergy, which is really nice for any sort of weapons-based build. Being able to affect beams, cannons, mines, or torpedoes means you can put this on pretty much anything as long as you're using multiple forms of weapons on that same build. Like on this build, I've got beams, I've got cannons, I've got a torpedo, any one of these could be getting that buff. So this is going to be pretty nice on an energy weapon build like this, or even a torpedo build. These two are the heavy hitters of the Miracle Worker specialization, and they're exactly why I like Miracle Worker seating. But let's take a quick look at the other Miracle Worker abilities. Aligned Shield Frequencies can actually be pretty good for a tank build. The actual shield heal itself isn't going to be overly useful, especially against enemies like the Borg. However, this heal applies to yourself and the rest of your team. Healing multiple targets like that is a great way for generating threat. So this ability can be useful for holding aggro against enemies in higher level TFOs, like ISE or Corfez. Deploy Gravitic Induction Platform This deploys a platform that creates a pull effect against enemy ships. It's not nearly as powerful as Gravity Well, but it does do a bit of shield damage, reveals cloaked ships, and disables pilot maneuvers. That last bit makes me think that this ability was made with PvP in mind. However, in PvE, there's really not much use for it. Also, despite the fact that this is worded like it's supposed to be a control ability, this will not trigger unconventional systems. In fact, Miracle Worker has no abilities that will trigger that personal trait. Destabilize Warp Core. It's a radiation damage over time effect. You apply it to an enemy, they'll take some radiation damage over time, but if the enemy dies while that effect is still in place, it will gain a secondary Warp Core explosion which will be more powerful than a normal Warp Core breach. This would be good for an EPG build or really anything that's focused around Gravity Well. You could pull a bunch of enemies together with Gravity Well and then hit one of them with this. Then when you kill that target, that Enhanced Warp Core Breach is going to kill everything else caught in the Gravity Well. It's not a super powerful ability, but if you have an abundance of Miracle Worker seating, this isn't bad to have. And really, it's the only Miracle Worker ability that's going to benefit EPG builds. Exceed Rated Limits is the firing mode of the specialization. It gives massive buffs to your firing cycle haste while cutting your weapon power draw to zero but in turn you'll also be taking some electrical damage over time, and your maximum power levels will be steadily dropping while this ability is active. It's not the best of the energy weapon firing modes. The massive haste buff for the max level version of this ability can be pretty nice so you can focus everything else on buffing your damage, but with that electrical damage you're probably going to want to put a heal in here as well, which to me is kind of annoying. So yeah, it's not terrible, but I would still take Beam Overload or Cannon Scatter Volley over this. Nanite Repair Payload, it basically turns one of your torpedoes into a heal. When you activate it, it'll start healing you for a time, but then once you actually fire the torpedo, that torpedo will head to one of your allies and heal them instead. Honestly, it sounds like kind of a waste of a torpedo to me. It's not that big of a heal, and it only affects you and the person that you use it on, so it's not going to be a big threat generator either like Alliance Shield Frequencies. Null Pointer Flood. It's basically a 4km confuse. It's mainly designed to confuse mines, targetable torpedoes, or pets, but does have a 20% chance to placate larger targets like enemy ships. Unless you're going up against a massive fleet of Scorpion fighters, I really don't see this being of any use. Overwhelm Power Regulators All it does is lower enemy power levels, has a chance to disable a random subsystem, and gives some electrical damage over time. Because it's electrical damage, I'm guessing this was also made for EPG builds in mind, but it's really not a lot of electrical damage. And lastly, Reroute Shields to Hull Containment. This will disable your shields and for the next 10 seconds give you a buff to all damage resistance, maximum hit points, and hull regeneration. This one's another tanking ability, more focused on your own survival. Because it disables your shields, this one's going to be more valuable against enemies like the Borg that can just rip through your shields very easily with Tachyon Beam. Full Miracle Worker ships also come with the Innovation Ship mechanic. Now, despite how much I like the seating, the Miracle Worker specialization mechanic is actually one of my least favorites. And that's because it's entirely designed around RNG. The mechanic itself kind of works like Simon says. You'll get three symbols here, Tactical, Engineering, or Science and you'll have to activate Bridge Officer abilities of those specific types before the effect will activate. But again, the effect that will be queued up will be entirely random, 
It can be a buff to your subsystem power levels, a temporary buff to your max hull, secondary shields, an area of effect plasma attack, bonus recharge speed to your bridge officer and captain abilities, or the Barkley Maneuver, which is a holographic copy of your ship that is sent to a nearby random foe at ramming speed, and then does a disappointingly low amount of damage. So yeah, some of these buffs aren't bad, like the power levels buff. Merrick Worker is already pretty nice for energy weapons, so getting that one's a nice bonus. The max hull is okay too, because that feeds into Tyler's duality, so that's more crit chance. But the rest of these buffs are kind of underwhelming. Except for the secondary shield buff, that one's just bad. So, to sum up, the pros and cons of Miracle Worker. Pro, it's really good for buffing energy weapon builds like Beam Overload or Cannon Scatter Volley. That's largely because of narrow sensor bands. It's also good for buffing other weapons types like torpedoes and mines, thanks to mixed armament synergy. It's also not bad for a tank build, largely because of Alliance shield frequencies. Though I would still rather have a command ship for a tank than a Miracle Worker. But some of the weaknesses for Miracle Worker is that it's not great for EPG and other science-heavy builds. Destabilized Warp Core and Overwhelmed Power Regulators just don't do enough to help those out. It also doesn't have any abilities that trigger unconventional systems. That personal trait plays a big part in the meta of pretty much every build type in the game these days, due to its ability to lower the cooldown of Universal Consoles. This is one of the reasons why I like the Lexington so much. It's a full Miracle Worker ship, so it has those energy weapon buffs but it also has a secondary intel seat, which intel does have abilities that will trigger unconventional systems. So for that reason, Miracle Worker blends really nicely with intel seating, also temporal for the same reason. Next up, we'll cover the intel specialization. This is another one that's really good for energy weapons, and that's largely because of its own firing mode, Surgical Strikes. Since the buff that the intel specialization got a while back, along with the Starship trait Vanguard Specialist that released with the legendary Jem'Hadar attack ship, this is probably now the most powerful firing mode type for energy weapons. What it does is give a very large buff to Cat 1 damage, a decent buff to accuracy, and really nice buffs to crit chance and crit severity. Another nice thing about Intel is that it has three different abilities that will trigger unconventional systems. Viral Impulse Burst, Electromagnetic Pulse Probe, and Ionic Turbulence. Ionic Turbulence is also an anomaly, which means it will trigger spore and fused anomalies. That means Intel also isn't bad for EPG builds. Remember, that's the science -y space magic builds. Okay, a closer look at each of the intel abilities. Like I said earlier, EMP Probe is really nice for an unconventional systems trigger. What it does exactly is fires an EMP probe at your target. Foes within 2 kilometers of the target will take a little bit of electrical damage and have a chance to be disabled for a few seconds. When the probe reaches your target, it'll deal a larger amount of electrical damage and disable for a much longer duration. The main selling point here is still unconventional systems, but still, not a bad ability. Surgical Strikes we kind of went over. Like I said, firing mode, big buff to cat 1 damage, crit chance and crit severity. Probably the best for energy weapons. The only downside is that it's only going to be of use on full intel ships. Like with any primary firing mode ability, you're going to want the best version that you can get on it. Surgical Strikes 3 is a commander level ability, so you're only going to be able to use this on a full intel ship. Anything less than that, like say on the Appalachia or the Mirror Warship, then you're probably better off going with Beam Overload or Cannon Scatter Volley. Evade Target Lock. This debuffs your enemy's damage, disables them for a short period, and makes you untargetable. Very much a PvP ability. I suppose it could be useful for PvE as well, but really I'd much rather have the unconventional systems triggers. Intelligence Team. This ability is focused on buffing your stealth and decreasing your threat generation. I've actually seen this ability used by people like my friend Neojet Angel. This is a key part in his solo ISE builds. The idea is to build up so much of a stealth buff that you're basically invisible to the enemy, and then you bombard the crap out of them with a torpedo build. It's very much a niche style of gameplay, but if you can pull it off, it's really cool. Ionic Turbulence, like I said earlier, this is one of the unconventional systems triggers. It's also an anomaly, making it really nice for EPG builds. I guess I should say even nicer for EPG builds, because unconventional system triggers are already really important for EPG builds. Though at this point in the game, they're kind of important for everything. Anyway, Ionic Turbulence. It creates a 3km AoE around a target. Any enemies within that area will receive debuffs to Flight Speed, Light Friction, and All Damage Resistance Rating. It also has a chance to hold and repel enemies. So yeah, this one's also pretty nice because of that Damage Res debuff. But again, the main selling point here is the Unconventional Systems Trigger. Kinetic Magnet. This will apply a Kinetic Damage Resistance debuff on an enemy target. And while that debuff is applied, all mines and targetable torpedoes within 10 kilometers will be confused and dragged toward that target. Now, based on that description, you would think this would be really good for a torpedo mine layer build. But honestly, it just it doesn't do the numbers that you would think it should be doing. Now, if this ability triggered unconventional systems like Ionic Turbulence does, then yeah, it would be really nice. But it doesn't, so I would just stick with those to get my universal consoles up that much quicker. Override Subsystem Safeties. I used to use this ability a lot with energy weapon builds, but it's kind of fallen out of favor with me. What it does is buff your current and maximum power levels. 
meaning depending on the level of the ability, you're going to get some nice buffs to all four of your subsystems. The most important one being your weapons power. Because it buffed your maximum power levels, you'd be able to buff your weapons power to above 125, which is the normal maximum. The effect diminishes over time, but the real downside is that once the ability expires, a randomly selected subsystem will go completely offline for 5 seconds. Ideally, it would be shields, because who needs those? Engine or aux power going offline can be a problem. But if it's weapons power, then you're really screwed, because that's 5 whole seconds where you're not able to shoot at all, and that's terrible for your DPS. That's why I stopped using this ability. I don't like the RNG factor. Subnucleonic Carrier Wave. It removes buffs. It also increases the recharge time of enemy powers. So this is another one that feels like it's a PvP ability. Subspace Beacon. With this ability, you drop a beacon, and when you activate it again, you will be teleported back to the location of that beacon. The downside is that if you fly too far away from the beacon, it will just self-destruct. Abilities like this often sound kind of interesting on paper, but when used in practice, they're kind of a mess. Torpedo Transport Warhead. This is a torpedo firing mode. It gives your next torpedo a 360 degree arc and 100% shield penetration. This is another one where on paper it sounds kind of cool, but in practice it's not that great. The amount of damage this thing does isn't really that great in comparison to torpedo spread or torpedo high yield. You would think detonating a torpedo inside a starship would do more damage, but it doesn't. And like I said, this is a torpedo firing mode, so it will share a cooldown with torpedo spread and high yield, so you don't want to mix those together. If they buffed its damage or lowered its cooldown, this could be an interesting ability, but as it is, I would just go with Torp Spread. Viral Impulse Burst. You know that one ability that the Klingon House Mokai Cruisers get that sent you flying across the map at full impulse and it's annoying and it's stupidly overpowered and I hate it so much? This is the player version. Now, the versions that the players get isn't nearly as powerful as what the Mokai have, which honestly is a really good thing. Having to chase your enemies all the way to the freaking Delta Quadrant just because someone activated Viral Impulse Burst would be really annoying. Now, the actual effect of this ability really isn't that useful. The only reason to use this is because it is an unconventional systems trigger. And for the mechanic that full intel ships get, gather intel. Now, this mechanic isn't bad, at least since the buff that intel got a while back. But because of how it works, it's really only going to be useful against larger, tougher targets. How it works is that you get four abilities down here, the first one being gather intel. This will apply stacks of vulnerability to your target. Once the target receives six, you'll be able to activate one of the other three abilities. The first one is called Vulnerability Defenses. This will give a debuff to damage resistance rating, shield hardness, and remove any engineering buffs. Exposed Vulnerability Weapon Systems will give debuffs to accuracy, damage, and remove any tactical buffs. And Exposed Vulnerability Critical Systems is a hold that will also remove any science buffs. Of the three, really only the first one is going to be of much use. Being able to lower a target's damage resistance means you and the rest of your team are going to be able to do more damage against it. So, Intel Ships overall. If you have a full intel ship that is a cruiser or an escort, you're definitely going to be well off with a Surgical Strikes build. A DPG build with intel seating is going to do pretty well too, because Ionic Turbulence will provide an additional anomaly. Ionic Turbulence is also very useful as an unconventional systems trigger, as are Electromagnetic Pulse Probe and Viral Impulse Burst. So that's three different abilities to trigger that trait. Intel seating is also valuable if you're wanting to get into the realm of solo ISE runs. Weaknesses in intel seating, there's not a lot of support for a tank build. Not that you couldn't put a tank build on an Intel Cruiser, I've done it myself. It's just not going to do quite as well as, say, a Command or America worker ship. And that's because a lot of Intel is meant to reduce your threat generation, whereas being a tank is more about increasing your threat generation. If you have a full Intel ship, a secondary Temporal Seat pairs really well with it. Temporal also has several abilities that will trigger unconventional systems, so paired together you can really reduce the cooldown of your Universal consoles. If you can get a Temporal ship with a Lieutenant Commander Temporal Seat, which currently I think there's only one, the Legendary Ambassador, You'll also be able to mix in Recursive Shearing 1, which also gets buffed by Vanguard Specialist, which is going to make your Surgical Strikes build very powerful. Miracle Worker would also pair really nicely with Intel. Surgical Strikes is already very powerful because of its buff to Crit Chance and Crit Severity, but if you can mix in a bonus damage buff from Narrow Sensor Bands, that's going to make them even more powerful. Mixed Armament Synergy would also be really helpful here because, again, that's more bonus damage. Command Seating would also be nice on an Intel ship as long as it's at least a Lieutenant Commander Seat. Then you would have access to Concentrate Firepower 3, and you'd be able to make a Torpedo build on it. Just as long as you also have room for High Yield 3. Though, frankly, a Torpedo build will still perform better on a full command ship. I talked about the Temporal Specialization in the previous two a little bit, so let's dive deeper into this one now. Temporal is probably one of the more well-rounded specializations. You could throw this on any type of ship, and it would be good. You really can't say that about any of the other specializations. Miracle Worker is nice for cruisers and escorts, but it's not graded on a science ship. It's kind of the same story with command seating. I guess Intel kind of goes well with all three, but not as well as Temporal does. And pilot seating, 
Well, we'll get to pilot seating. On cruisers and escorts, Temporal is pretty nice for an energy weapon build like Beam Overload or Cannon Scatter Volley, but that's mostly just because Temporal really isn't well suited for anything else, at least on its own. The thing that really makes Temporal seating so special is recursive shearing. What it does is mark a target and for the next 10 seconds it will accumulate a buildup of damage. That's damage from any source, you or any friendlies that are also firing on the same target. It'll build up a portion of all that damage and then deal it in one massive blow of physical damage to that target. So this is a bridge officer ability that's really nice for killing those big heavy tanky targets. Another really nice thing about Temporal is its unconventional systems triggers. Like Intel, the Temporal specialization also has three individual abilities that will trigger that trait. However, most of the Temporal ones actually have a lower cooldown than all the ones in Intel. So you're actually going to be able to get the cooldowns of those universal consoles down even faster with Temporal seating. Because you'll be able to trigger the trait that much more with the lower cooldowns. Additionally, two of these unconventional systems triggers are also anomalies. Chronometric Inversion Field and Timeline Collapse will both trigger Spore-infused anomalies. This is one of a number of reasons why Temporal is actually probably the best specialization for science vessels. Not only does it have the best array of unconventional systems triggers, but a lot of Temporal abilities deal physical damage, which is a form of exotic damage. That includes Recursive Shearing. Exotic damage is the backbone of most science builds, so these two pair very well together. Speaking of physical damage, I want to talk about one more thing about Temporal abilities, and that's a unique mechanic that they have called Entropy. Most Temporal abilities are divided into two categories, Entropy Builders and Entropy Consumers. An Entropy Builder can apply a stack of Entropy to an enemy. How many stacks will be applied will depend on the ability. But some abilities, like Timeline Collapse, are Entropy Consumers, which will remove all stacks of Entropy from the target. Those Entropy stacks will then buff the damage of that Consumer ability. So, for example, I've got Heisenberg Amplifier, Chronometric Inversion Field, and Recursive Shearing all on this build, all of which are Entropy Builders. So I hit a target with each one of those, and it will receive four stacks of Entropy. One from Heisenberg and Chronometric, and two from Recursive Shearing. Timeline Collapse is an Entropy Consumer, so once I hit the target with that, it'll consume those four stacks of Entropy and buff Timeline Collapse even further. It's a unique way for buffing your own Bridge Officer abilities, and it kind of forces you to think a little bit differently when setting up a Temporal Ship in comparison to other types of ships. Okay, now let's dive into the buff abilities, first starting with Casual Reversion. This one is a Hull Heal ability. This heal actually buffs itself by consuming the Entropy of nearby enemy targets. So depending on how much Entropy has been dished out, this could actually be a pretty decent heal. Channel Deconstruction is a physical damage attack that builds up damage over time. Each second it's active on a target, it gradually becomes more and more powerful. Additionally, every two seconds it builds up one stack of Entropy on your target. Dealing physical damage and being a nice Entropy builder, this is a really nice one for EPG builds. Chronometric Inversion Field, this is one of our unconventional systems triggers. What it does is create a field around a target, and any foes within 5 kilometers of that field will receive a little bit of physical damage as well as debuffs to their flight speed and damage. Additionally, this also has a chance to build a stack of Entropy. Entropic Cascade, this is a physical damage over time ability. Every second it's active, it can also strike a secondary target within 3 kilometers with some additional physical damage. Though if there are no secondary targets within range, it will build up a stack of Entropy on the primary target. This one's not bad for EPG builds, because you're already going to have everything clustered together in a gravity well. That way you'll have a greater chance of having more secondary targets. Entropic Redistribution. This one hits an enemy with physical damage. It'll also deal additional physical damage for every stack of entropy on the target. In turn, it will remove every stack of entropy from that target, but then add stacks of entropy to every enemy within 5 kilometers of the primary target, also dealing some additional physical damage. This is another one that's not bad for EPG builds, because again, Gravity Well is going to have everything clustered together, and you're going to be able to hit multiple targets at once pretty easily. Just remember, while some of these extra temporal abilities are still pretty good for certain build types, you don't want to sacrifice on your unconventional systems triggers. If you have the extra temporal seating, by all means go for it, but there aren't a lot of ships that have that much temporal seating. Honestly, the only one I can think of is the Tier 6 version of the Wells. Gravimetric Conversion. This is an AoE shield drain. It'll drain shields from any foes within 3 kilometers, and drain additional shields for any stacks of entropy that might be on those ships, and it'll add that shield power to your own shields. This might be okay for a tank build, because you're going to be hitting multiple enemies at once and healing yourself, so that'll at least generate a bit of threat. That said, 3 kilometers is not a long range, so you're going to have to be right up on those ships. Honestly, this really isn't something I would consider worth using, even on a tank build. Heisenberg Amplifier, Temporal's second unconventional systems trigger. What this does is create a small 3 km radius around a target that will confuse enemies caught within that radius. Additionally, it'll also teleport an enemy target to a random location within 2 kilometers of its current location, randomizing its location and facing. 
The teleport is really meant to kind of disorient your enemy, which obviously that's only going to be helpful in PvP, but the fact that the teleport is only 2 kilometers means it's not going to be a huge hassle in PvE either. It also builds up one stack of entropy on an enemy. But the big selling point here is that not only is it an unconventional systems trigger, but of all the abilities that trigger unconventional systems, this is the one with the lowest cooldown, meaning you'll be able to trigger that trait that much more often. This is really the ability that puts Temporal ahead of Intel in terms of unconventional systems triggers. Rapid Decay is a short physical damage over time effect and an all damage resistance debuff. It'll apply that physical dot and the damage debuff for 5 seconds, but it'll add an additional second to these effects for every stack of entropy on the primary target, in exchange for consuming those stacks of entropy. Again, this one's not bad, but it's really going to be a matter of just how much temporal seeding are you going to have room for. I already went over this one a bit, Recursive Shearing! Like I said earlier, this is a significant part of the reason why I like temporal so much. The potential damage that this ability can put out is just fantastic, I love it. I know some people have criticized this ability, saying that it's sort of a cheap way of using other people's damage to benefit your own, but to that, I say... <laughs> shared Fate! This is a shield drain that gets more powerful over time, draining enemy shields and lowering shield resistance. It also has a chance to build up a stack of entropy for every second it's active. Honestly, this one really isn't much better than Gravimetric Conversion. It's a shield drain ability, there's not much to it. Unless you're building an actual drain build, this really isn't going to do all that much for you. And to wrap up the buff abilities, Temporal's third and final unconventional systems trigger, Timeline Collapse. What it does is generate a weak pull around an enemy, it'll reveal cloak ships and disable pilot maneuvers, and deal some physical damage to anything within 3 kilometers. These effects are enhanced by consuming entropy. Like I said, this is an unconventional systems trigger, so either way you're going to want it, assuming you have that trait. The only downside to this ability is that its lowest version is at Lieutenant Commander. So if you're dealing with a ship that isn't a full temporal ship, you're probably going to have to pick and choose between this or Recursive Shearing. Moving on to the ship mechanic that temporal ships get, the Molecular Deconstruction Beam. This is probably my second favorite of the specialization ship mechanics. How it works is that you have three configurations, Offensive, Defensive, and Support. Each one will give you different passive buffs. The Offensive configuration is mostly speed focused, giving buffs to engine power, flight speed, and turn rate. It'll also give a debuff to incoming hull heals. Defensive Configuration gives buffs to Shield Power and Incoming Hull Heals, but it lowers your flight speed and turn rate. And the Support Configuration gives buffs to Auxiliary Power, Exotic Damage, and Control Expertise, while giving a debuff to Energy Weapon Damage. Now, for every 10 seconds one of these configurations is active, they will give a counter. Once you have 6 counters, you will be able to activate the Molecular Deconstruction Beam. The beam has 3 effects. It'll deal physical damage to an enemy target, give you a hull heal, and disable your enemy target for a short duration. All three of these effects will scale depending on the kind of counters that you've built up. Offensive counters will buff the physical damage, defensive counters will buff the hull heal, and support counters will extend the duration of that disable. For energy weapon builds, I typically stick with the offensive configuration. The speed buffs are nice, especially if you're using a forward-facing build like dual beam banks or cannons, and you'll get the most physical damage out of the deconstruction beam. The defensive configuration, I don't use that for anything, not even a tank build. Honestly, a tank build would be better off with either one of the other two. Speed is important for a tank because they've got to keep up with the rest of the team, and generating hull heals isn't difficult so you really don't need to worry about that debuff. Support wouldn't be bad either because then you could at least extend the duration on that disable on the deconstruction beam. The support configuration is really good for science builds. Auxiliary power, exotic damage, and control expertise are all very important stats for science builds, so a passive buff to all three of those is kind of a no-brainer. And most science builds tend to be more torpedo heavy because having to use energy weapons means they're going to have to split their power levels between aux power and weapons power. Better to just use torpedoes and mines and throw everything to aux power. It's actually the same story with normal torpedo builds. They don't rely on energy weapons so they don't have to worry about the debuff. And the exotic damage is actually going to be kind of helpful for torpedo builds because a lot of the stuff torpedo builds use does do a little bit of exotic damage. Stuff from the procs that a lot of the torpedoes and mines they use, or even stuff as chemocyte lace weaponry. A lot of that is radiation damage, which is a form of exotic damage. Of course, torpedo builds would also benefit from the offensive configuration too. More speed and turn rate often isn't a bad thing to have. So yeah, up to you on that one. So overall, for the strengths of the temporal specialization, it's very well suited for buffing and generating exotic damage, so that's good for your science builds. It has the best array of unconventional systems triggers. It works well enough with pretty much any build type, and plus there's Recursive Shearing, which is always a great ability for dealing out big damage against massive targets. Downsides to the Temporal Specialization? Frankly, it doesn't have much that directly buffs energy weapons or projectile weapons. Though honestly, the Unconventional Systems triggers plus Recursive Shearing kind of makes up for that. It's kind of the same story for tank builds. It's got a couple abilities that sound like they were designed with tanking in mind, 
but a lot of it isn't as good as some of the stuff from Miracle Worker or Command or even just the regular three divisions. But the shortcomings of Temporal Seeding can really be made up for with another specialization seat, or can further enhance its own strengths. Intel can pair well with this because that's just more unconventional systems triggers. Paired with a Miracle Worker seat, you can better buff your energy weapons. And with sufficient command and tactical seating, Temporal can mix in pretty nice for a torpedo build. Next up, we're going to cover the Command Specialization. Command is very much a specialization of extremes, meaning that there are things about it that are very good and things about it that are very not good. It was initially designed as being more of a support role, having many abilities that are designed to buff other members of your team. But Command also opened the door for torpedo builds, which shot a lot of these ships to the top of the DPS boards. And that's why Command is good for two things, tank builds and torpedo builds. Tank builds are designed to take a lot of punishment, generate a lot of threat, and support your other teammates as much as possible. Whereas torpedo builds are designed to dish out as much damage as they can using torpedoes and mines. I've said repeatedly that command seating is essential for a torpedo build, and that is because of the ability Concentrate Firepower. Concentrate Firepower not only buffs your kinetic damage and shield penetration, but it also grants you an additional torpedo high yield 1. One that doesn't trigger a shared cooldown with your normal torpedo firing modes. That's one of the keys to a successful torpedo build. Getting as many ways as possible to trigger a firing mode for your torpedoes that won't trigger a shared cooldown. Because you can't extend a firing mode for a torpedo build like you can with Beam Overload or Scatter Volley. So once you trigger your torpedo high yield, it's down until the cooldown's over. That's why you need Concentrate Firepower to get more high yields. This is also why the Starship trait in Twine Tactical Matrices is so popular on torpedo builds. It gives you free hits of torpedo spread without triggering a shared cooldown on your bridge officer abilities. The downside to Concentrate Firepower is that it is technically considered a team support ability, so its buff will go to the next friendly target that fires a torpedo, which may or may not be you. This is why torpedo builds can be so touchy. You never really know how much of your Concentrate Firepower is actually going to be going to another member of your team. Additionally, if you are using Concentrate Firepower 3, you have to make sure you are using the Rank 3 version, because only one Concentrate Firepower buff can be applied at a time. So if one player activates Concentrate Firepower 3, and you activate Concentrate Firepower 1 or 2 after that, you can potentially override that Concentrate Firepower 3, which is generally considered rather rude. So it is Concentrate Firepower 3 or nothing. Okay, I think we've talked about that one enough, let's dive in deeper to the other command abilities. Ambush Marker. This is a perfect example of what I said earlier about how command abilities are either really good or really not good, because this falls into the really not good category. How it works is you drop an Ambush Marker at your current location, then any allies that move within 3 kilometers of the marker will gain buffs to Stealth, and when any enemies move within 3 kilometers of it, it will trigger Ambush, which will summon in two friendly NPC ships to attack your enemies, and give you and any allies a nice bonus damage buff. It sounds great, except for the fact that this ability cannot be triggered while in combat. Meaning you have to avoid the rest of your team and every enemy on the map, and then pull your enemies to that point. All for a damage buff that's gonna last 30 seconds or less, depending on the rank of the ability. Combat in Star Trek Online is far too fast-paced for this to be of any use, especially in the current state of the game. So the fact that you can't activate this ability while in combat completely ruins it. Call Emergency Artillery! This is one I actually really like. It calls in three artillery ships and sends them in the direction of your primary target. Those three ships will emit an AoE kinetic damage aura around them until they warp out or are destroyed. This ability pairs really well with torpedo mine layer builds because it's kinetic damage. You should already be trying to buff your kinetic damage with a torpedo mine layer build, so by buffing that, you're also going to be buffing this ability. The downside with this ability is that its lowest rank is at Lieutenant Commander, which will take up the same space as Concentrate Firepower 3. So if you're wanting to run this on a torpedo build, you're probably going to have to do it on a full command ship. That said, if you're running an energy weapon build, this ability still isn't bad. Since the command specialization got buffed a while back, this ability does some decent damage, even if you're not built for buffing kinetic damage. It may not be the very best bridge officer ability to use in those situations, but it's certainly not useless, and frankly, it's just a lot of fun. I really can't imagine a time where firing three Defiant class ships at my enemy not fun. Concentrate Firepower. Like I said, I already went over this one. It's the backbone of a torpedo build. The big downsides with it is that you have to use Concentrate Firepower 3, and that you never really know where this buff is going to go. It could be applied to you, one of your teammates, or a friendly NPC. But it is still essential for a torpedo build. It's also good for a support tank as well. Because its buff is also applied to teammates, you could potentially help a friendly torpedo build player. That's kind of the ideal scenario for a torpedo build. Get as many players as you can using Concentrate Firepower 3. Needs of the many! This one is sort of a hull heal? What it does is set your shields to zero and then applies temporary hull to all your teammates. So I guess it's kind of like reverse tanking? 
I really can't see a lot of scenarios where this is going to be super helpful because if you're tanking, you're going to be taking all the punishment. You want to keep as much HP as you can. You don't want to be handing that out to other players. If your teammates are in trouble, there are better ways to help heal them, like overloaded SIF linkage, the protometa projector, or turn the tide. Overwhelm emitters, hit the shield drain, and shield heal. It'll drain the shields of a marked target and regenerate the shields of friendlies. It's not bad for a tank build because draining shields and healing them at the same time is going to generate a bit of threat, but there are more useful abilities you could probably slot there instead. Phalanx Formation. It lets you drop a Phalanx Marker once every 10 seconds, maxing out at 3. Allies that pass through these markers will gain buffs to accuracy and defense. Those buffs increasing the more markers they pass through. It's kind of an interesting idea for a support build, but the problem is that accuracy and defense really aren't worth buffing. Buffing accuracy is really only going to have any beneficial effect in PvP, so this isn't going to be very useful in TFOs. And defense rating isn't going to matter if you're already running with a tank. So yeah, really not something I would consider using in really any situation. Rally Point Marker. Unlike Ambush Marker and Phalanx Formation, this one's really straightforward. You just drop it where you are and it does its thing. Honestly, I really wish Ambush Marker functioned the way this ability does. This one is a heal ability. When you drop it, any allies that are inside the marker will receive heals to shields and hull, and will have any debuffs removed. This one's pretty decent for a tank build, because you're going to be healing multiple allies at the same time, including yourself, and that's going to be generating threat. I think this one is particularly useful if you're still kind of new to tanking, especially if you're still struggling to generate enough threat to keep all attention on you. At least this way your allies will have some extra heals to help keep them alive. Reroute power from life support. What this does is repair any damaged subsystems, buffs all your power levels, and buffs all the maximum subsystem power levels that you can have. The trade-off is that it increases the recharge speed of your bridge officer abilities. That is not a good trade-off. Lowering your bridge officer cooldowns has become an incredibly important part of the Star Trek Online meta. That way you can use your bridge officer abilities again that much more quickly. Increasing those cooldowns is one of the last things you want to be doing. There are plenty of better and less costly ways of buffing your subsystem power levels. Subspace Interception what this does is basically teleport you to an ally that's in trouble and take all attention on them and put it on you. You use it on a target with 50% health or less, you teleport nearby them, you'll get a buff to your damage resistance and taunt up to 10 enemies within 5 kilometers of you, assuming your threatening stance is on. The ally you teleported to will become untargetable and immune for a short time, and also gain a small heal over time. It's basically the Star Trek equivalent of jumping in front of someone who's in trouble and going, pick on someone your own size. It's clearly made with a tank build in mind, because no one else would want that much threat on them. The problem is that while this ability sounds good on paper, in practice it's kinda... not great. For one, you have no idea what direction you'll be facing when you teleport to that ally. So you could be pointing yourself in the wrong direction, making it more difficult to get back to the rest of your team and thereby just leaving them to die. That's kinda the problem with teleport abilities in Star Trek Online, there's too many unknowns. The other issue is that this can only be activated on a target with 50% hull. This goes back to how fast-paced Star Trek Online combat often is, so if they're at 50% hull, odds are they're probably already dead and just don't know it yet. In cases like that, you want something more fast-acting that isn't going to force you to also abandon the rest of your team, like Turn the Tide or the Protomatter Projector, assuming they're close enough. And frankly, if you're playing content that requires you to run with another player that's using a tank build, one of the first rules of that situation is don't wander away from the tank. That goes for Star Trek Online and pretty much every other MMO. If you do, that's kind of your fault. And the last bridge officer ability in the command specialization, Suppression Barrage. This is another one that's really nice for tank builds. While this is activated, your weapons fire will debuff enemy targets. Specifically, it will debuff outgoing damage, flight speed, turn rate, and accuracy rating. This debuff will be applied to every enemy that you fire upon, so this pairs really well with Fire at Will or Scatter Volley, depending on if you're using beams or cannons. Though if you're running a tank build, you're probably using beams. This can also be pretty helpful if you're just playing on your own as well. Especially if you're struggling with survival in episodes or patrols, Suppression Barrage is a really nice way to reduce your enemy's outgoing damage, so they can't hit you quite as hard. Now let's move on to the ship mechanic for the command specialization, the Inspiration mechanic. As you and your teammates activate Bridge Officer abilities while in combat, you will build up Inspiration, which you'll see on this progress bar at the bottom of this little menu. When it hits 100%, you will be able to activate one of these three abilities. Turn the Tide, against all odds, or battle preparation. The cool thing about these abilities is that they will apply to you and every single other player on the team. Turn the Tide is a large heal ability, granting plus 100 damage resistance and 300% hull regeneration for the next 15 seconds. This makes for a great panic button if you or one of your teammates is about to die. Against all odds, this is a team-wide damage buff. This will grant plus 33% bonus all damage, 
and minus 100% to your weapon's power cost. That weapon's power cost reduction is really only going to help anyone running an energy weapon build. And battle preparations, which will reduce the recharge time of your bridge officer abilities. This one honestly is kind of redundant, because proper bridge officer cooldown management can be managed just fine with a Nox to Bat build or Boimler effect, or Photonic Officer. Piling this on top of those really isn't going to do all that much. Against all odds is by far the best ability, being a straight up bonus damage buff, but the heal from Turn the Tide can certainly be useful from time to time as well. The Inspiration mechanic is my favorite of all the Specialization Starship mechanics. It's simple, straight to the point, and very powerful. I kinda wish I could have it on all my ships. So yeah, the strengths of the Command Specialization. Command seating is essential for a torpedo build, there's a lot of support for tank abilities in these things as well, and the Starship mechanic can either be a massive bonus damage buff or a massive heal. As for some of the weaknesses in Command, one of the biggest ones is that a lot of the lower level abilities really aren't that great. I'm talking the stuff at like Ensign and Lieutenant level. I've already talked about how Concentrate Firepower needs to be level 3 or nothing at all. You've got Rally Point Marker 1 in the Lieutenant level, and Overwhelming Meters 1 and 2 in the lower levels. But even then, those aren't going to have much benefit on most build types. So you're likely not going to get much use out of a command seat that is Lieutenant or lower. Furthermore, there really isn't much support for Energy Weapon builds or EPG builds. Reroute Power from Life Support could be good for either of those build types because of the power level buffs. But, like I said, its increase to your Bridge Officer cooldowns makes that ability more harmful than good. And one more downside is that Command has no abilities that will trigger unconventional systems, so you're going to be all the more reliant on Science Seating for that. Unless you have a Secondary Specialization Seat, because this is why Command pairs really well with Temporal or Intel, then you'll have access to those unconventional systems triggers. Command can pair pretty well with Merrick Worker as well. As long as it's at least a Lieutenant level seat, then you'll get access to Mixed Armament Synergy, which can be nice for its bonus damage buff. And now for the one that I've kind of been dreading, Pilot Specialization. I've been very upfront about my opinions on Pilot Seating and how it's not very good, and I guess this is going to be a good opportunity to explain why. Pilot Specialization is very focused on speed and maneuverability. So much so that some of its abilities can't even be activated unless your throttle is at at least 50%. Pilot Specialization requires you to be constantly moving and constantly circling around your target. This is part of the reason why I don't like it. I don't like abilities that force me to fly or play a certain way, which is what the pilot specialization does. With all the other specializations, I am free to use my ship however I see fit. The other reason why I don't like the pilot specialization is because a lot of its bridge officer abilities just aren't very useful, especially on a ship that isn't an escort or a full pilot ship. Now before I get all completely negative about pilot, let's talk about one strategy I have to make it, well, not totally terrible. There is one strategy that you can use pilot seating in order to build up a nice amount of crit chance, which is really nice for your DPS. It requires two seats of pilot team, the personal trait fresh from r and and the starship trait synthetic good fortune. With synthetic good fortune, every time you use a pilot bridge officer ability or a control bridge officer ability, you will gain a small buff that increases your crit chance and your control expertise. This buff can stack up to 40 times. So you want to be spamming control abilities and pilot abilities as much as possible. That's where fresh from r and comes in it'll reduce the shared cooldown of Team Bridge Officer abilities. Pilot Team's cooldown is already pretty low, so by reducing its shared cooldown, you're going to be able to spam both of those really quickly, and thus building up a potential of a 20% crit chance buff. And that Control Expertise buff also makes this pretty useful for a science build as well. Okay, now let's move on to the individual pilot abilities. Attack Pattern Lambda. This gives you a buff to accuracy and perception, while decreasing the accuracy and perception of your enemies, and giving a small chance to confuse. Accuracy is not an important stat outside of PvP. Perception isn't really all that useful either, so this really isn't going to help you all that much. Clean Getaway! Foes inside your rear-facing arc within 5 kilometers of you will have their aggro reset, receive a fragile placate, and have their flight speed debuffed while yours is significantly buffed. Basically, it lets you run away from your enemies. I don't want to run away from my enemies, I want to blow them up. Coolant Ignition! It ejects a cloud of engine coolant that will ignite after 10 seconds, Foes within the cloud will receive a debuff to flight speed and turn rate for a short time, and after that initial 10 seconds, the plasma cloud will explode, dealing plasma damage to the enemies within for the next 5 seconds. Okay, this one I don't totally hate. It's kind of like an exploding version of eject warp plasma. However, the fact that this debuff speed and turn rate means this sounds like a control ability, which means it should trigger unconventional systems. But it doesn't. I would like this ability much more if it did. In fact, currently Pilot has no abilities that will trigger that personal trait. Deploy Countermeasures. It makes you immune to kinetic damage, destroys targetable torpedoes and mines within 3 kilometers, and has a chance to confuse for a short duration. A duration that is doubled against fighters and frigates. 
I mean, if I'm ever fighting a giant fleet of scorpion fighters, this might be useful, but as it is, it's kind of underwhelming. It could be kind of decent on a tank, except for that Confuse. You generally don't want to use too many Confuse abilities on a tank build because you want to keep aggro on you. If you Confuse enemies, they're just going to start firing at anything at random. Route Reserves to Weapons This is the energy weapon firing mode of the pilot specialization. What it does is buff your energy weapon haste by draining some of your engine power. Overall, this thing is basically just a crappier version of Exceed Rated Limits. Because not only does the level 3 version of this ability only get your weapon's haste up to 60%, whereas Exceed Rated Limits gets up to 100%, but if your engines somehow go offline, this ability cuts out immediately. And because this is a firing mode ability, it will trigger a shared cooldown with Beam Overload or any other energy weapon firing mode ability. Flyer Apart What it does is give you an impressive buff to your flight speed, which will gradually increase over time. In turn, you'll receive a small amount of physical damage to your hull over time as this ability is active. After this first effect is complete, you will receive a small bonus damage buff for the next 10 seconds. You cannot activate this ability if your throttle is below 50% or your hull is at below 25%. So not only do I have to be moving in order to activate this, but I have to wait 15 seconds to receive that bonus damage buff. Which is very small, by the way. The rank 3 version of this ability only gives 3% bonus damage. There are much easier and much quicker ways of building bonus damage. This next one is Form Up. This is another teleport ability. You select an allied target within 10 kilometers of you and it'll immediately teleport you to their location. For the next 20 seconds, as long as that target remains within 5 kilometers, both of you will receive a decent damage buff. This one sounds great on paper, but the problem is after the teleport, you never know what direction you're going to be facing. I remember a while ago, Augie was testing this ability out. The big frustration was that after the teleport, most of the time you'd be facing away from all the enemies. Which is really bad for your DPS. If you can't shoot at a thing, your damage is going to suffer. And it was always a random direction. The unpredictability of this teleport makes it completely unreliable. Hold Together! It's a hull heal and damage resistance buff. It's pretty straightforward. If your throttle is at 75% or higher, it also removes one hazard debuff per second. More things forcing me to move, great. But yeah, it's an okay heal. Not much more to say about it than that. Lock Trajectory. Oh boy. What it does is sets your inertia to zero, gives you a massive turn rate buff, and locks you on your current speed and trajectory. The idea is so you can kind of strafe alongside a vessel while still pointing it in the direction that you want to. This is, in my opinion, the worst bridge officer ability in the game. All it does is keep you sliding in one direction for 15 seconds. That's it. Pilot ships are already insanely maneuverable. I don't need some sliding mechanic to keep my ship pointed in the direction I want it to. And with how fast these ships tend to be, all I end up doing is just sliding myself out of weapons range. That doesn't help anything at all. The only thing this ability is good for is to make your ship look as ridiculous as possible. Wanna know how I know? That's how. And before people start yelling at me in the comments, yes, I know about that duty officer that gives you a bonus damage buff while you have Lock Trajectory active. It only has a 25% chance to activate. Maybe if it were a guaranteed buff, I'd think differently. But for now, I can't be bothered with RNG. And yes, I know about the Starship trade-off the Mars. But being able to toggle the most useless bridge officer ability off and on still makes it the most useless bridge officer ability. Okay, let's move on before this becomes the entire video. Pilot Team! I went over this a little bit in regards to that trick with Synthetic Good Fortune. What the actual ability itself does is give you a buff to turn rate and flight speed, and makes you immune to movement debuffs. So yeah, on its own, not all that impressive. But as long as you have room for two of these, along with Fresh from R&R and Synthetic Good Fortune, they're not bad to have. Reinforcement Squadron. Now, I really want to like this ability, but I, I just can't. What it does is summon a small group of friendly small craft that will fight alongside you. You guys know I like my pet builds, which is why I want to like this ability. However, the abilities that they gave to these small craft are just horrible. The rank 3 version is equipped with a 360 degree beam array and a set of dual cannons, and they can use cannon rapid fire 3, pilot team 3 but only on itself, evasive maneuvers, shield scraping, and scratch the paint. Speed buffs like evasive maneuvers and pilot team have no business being on NPC ships. They're just not programmed to use them in any proper way. And shield scraping, anything that requires a pet to be in a certain position is terrible, because you never know where a pet is going to go. Once they're launched, they have a mind of their own. So yeah, I want to like it, but they need to make these pets better. And the last bridge officer ability for the pilot specialization is Subspace Boom. 
When activated, it creates a 3km radius of kinetic damage, and it'll create a subspace distortion, which will debuff enemy flight speed and defense rating. Normally this one wouldn't sound too bad, but your throttle needs to be at at least 50%, so yet another ability forcing me to move. The mechanic that you get with full pilot ships is called Pilot Maneuvers. It lets you sharply maneuver in one of any four directions. Left, right, forward, or reverse. While the maneuver is active, you'll also gain a short immunity to damage. I guess the idea there is that you could potentially dodge an incoming attack by barrel rolling out of the way. However, in the end, pilot maneuvers are really little more than just a gimmick. You fly around real fast and do some cool barrel roll animations. And I admit, it can be fun, but pilot maneuvers don't do much to improve the actual performance of your build like the other ship mechanics. There's no benefit to your own damage output, the damage immunity is so short it's barely worth mentioning, and all it does is leave me wishing that it did more. So, what are the strengths of the pilot specialization? Well, speed and maneuverability, that one's obvious. It also provides an easy way to build crit chance and control expertise, but that is kind of reliant on you owning a specific starship trait and personal trait, which some might consider a weakness because those traits aren't free. And that's about it. Weaknesses. Abilities that force you into a certain style of flying. Very few ways of buffing your weapons damage. That goes for both energy weapons and kinetic. And the whole specialization is more reliant on a gimmick than actually benefiting the game. So yeah, these are the strengths and weaknesses of each starship specialization. I hope it helps you in picking out a ship for your own, or building one that you already have. If you have any questions or comments on ship specializations, be sure to leave them in the comment section down below. While you're down there, be sure to hit like and subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. If you'd like to further support the channel, uh, you can hit that join button to become a member, or hit the super thanks button, or find the merch store link in the description of the video. I actually just added some new items to the merch store recently, so be sure to check that out if you haven't already. Either way, thank you so much for watching. My name's Stu, and I will see you guys next time.